Okay, we're going to have a bit of a look here at gel electrophoresis. Now let's think about what uh, this all means. Um, gel, it uses a, a gel as the medium. It actually uses a gel called, called agarose. Um, and it, you know, it's probably like a bit of a thicker version than the, the type of jelly that you might um, eat and have in your fridge at home. Um, it, it uses electricity, electro, and phoresis, which means it basically means migration or to separate. So it's using gel as a medium and electricity to separate molecules. And the molecules we're talking about in, in this phoresis is, um, is DNA. And we're going to separate them based on size. So here we have an example of a, a gel electrophoresis machine. Um, they can look um, quite a bit different. They basically um, often look a bit like lunch boxes with um, bits of solution floating and a bit of gel in the middle um, and some electrodes uh, down either end, um, the, the electro bit. So here we have an example of one that, that's been opened up and um, again we can see our electrodes um, will we'll have um, negative on one end and positive attached to the other end. Um, we have a, a solution sitting in there um, it's usually a, a buffer solution and uh, in this case the buffer solution the purpose of it is to conduct electricity. We have in the middle here um, a gel, okay, our agarose gel and we have these small little um, holes or divots that have been put in our gel with this comb and when the gel has been setting this comb has been sitting in with these ends sitting along here making little holes and those little holes are where we're going to uh, deposit um, our DNA sample and what we can see here is our DNA sample moving through the gel so let's have a look at how all this happens so here's a bit of a real version of someone putting uh, a, a, a DNA sample into the gel okay and they'll be doing that in, in a solution so um, quite often the sample is dyed, so you can see where, you, where you're actually putting it. You just don't drop it in any, anywhere. And it, it usually has something mixed with it to make it a little bit heavier. Because what we want the, the uh, gel to do is to sit down into the, into the little hole in the, in the little well in the, um, in the gel. So it needs to be coloured. It also needs to be a bit heavier so it sits in there. And that's got the DNA sample in there. The DNA sample that we have in there um, will usually be um, a, a sample of DNA that has been replicated a lot of time, maybe by PCR, um, and it's been cut up um, with restriction enzymes. And it's that, that cutting up that's going to give us our samples of different sizes. So this view is sh sort of showing us what we might see from above. We have our different wells, uh, we have our electrodes, um, a negative one here and our positive one here. And what's going to happen is our sample is going to move from the negative. The sample is going to move from the negative end towards the positive end. And our DNA sample does that because DNA is slightly negative charged. Um, the, the phosphates of the sugar phosphate backbone have a slightly negative charge. So when we put it in, a, you know, uh, in an area with electric charge, the slightly negative is going to be repelled from the negative and being attracted towards a positive, so it's going to move through the gel. Now this agarose gel that we were talking about before, um, that agarose gel is, is basically like a, um, a network of small holes. Um, it's, it's porous, um, and if you can imagine it sort of being like a sponge, and these DNA strands slowly having to weave their way through. And it means that the smaller strands can move through a lot quicker than the bigger strands. Um, the bigger strands are a lot slower at weaving their way through. So, so what that results in is um, the bigger strands don't get very far, whereas the smaller strands move a lot further. And we can see um, some numbers along here, and that's telling us how many bases they have, and they're talking about kilobase pairs. So how many thousands of base pairs? And we can see that the larger strands here that are 80 kilo bases didn't get very far whereas the the smallest ones here got the furthest now what, what this allows us to do is to compare the pattern from one person say person D here with person C um, now 
being different people, they have different DNA and a different sequence in their DNA. So when we treat it with a restriction enzyme, we expect it to be broken up in a different pattern. Now this is an alternative sort of view that we sometimes see of gel electrophoresis where they, they sit it up um, vertically and we have the same sort of thing. Some wells where the DNA samples sit in um, and the DNA samples migrate down with gravity but mainly due to the electricity. Um, the smaller fragments move further, the larger fragments don't move as far and we can compare samples from different, different uh, people. Uh, really good for forensics, paternity tests. Um, things like that. Okay, let's just pause to have a, a look at how um, the, the different people's DNA strands can be broken up. And if we can consider we took a, a particular section of uh, DNA from person A and person B, we can imagine that the length of DNA is roughly the same. And we might cut that out from all of their DNA using a really specific restriction enzyme. So when we add the restriction enzyme, because the code and the sequence of the nucleotides is different in person A compared to person B, when the restriction enzyme comes along, it's going to cut person A enzymes, uh, sorry, cut person A's DNA in different places than it would cut person B. Not only different places, but it can also cut it a different number of times. So what we're going to end up with is fragments of different lengths, DNA fragments of different lengths and also different numbers. We can see there's three different fragments in person A and two fragments in person B and the fragments are different lengths. Um, these fragments are pretty similar. That's a lot longer than these fragments. Um, and these fragments are, are what are going to cause our different patterns. So let's look at how this might transfer into a gel. So if we imagine these being our gels down here with our negative end and our positive end here, uh, person A has one small fragment which is going to travel a long way through the gel. It can weave its way through quite easily. Uh, it has a medium sized band and a, a longer band. Person B ha um, only has two bands rather than the three. So we can see two bands. Both of them are quite long. So neither of them travel very far through. And both of these are a bit longer than person A's longest band, so they don't travel through quite as far in comparison. So we can see same section of, of DNA cut up quite differently, producing a different banding pattern. Now the results that we get can be um, stained um, or, or looked at in different ways, sometimes with a fluorescent stain like these two here, sometimes with some, some particular uh, dyes as well. Um, and, and you might need to look at it under, under particular lighting um, to be able to see them properly. Um, what you can see in a few of these samples here is we have some samples down the side and these are quite often our standards and they'll be of a sample that we might put in, in one of our wells of known sizes and we can see that there are most of our samples here. So you know, th this one here we can see that um, we know that in our standard which is number one a thousand base pair molecule would travel this far, whereas a, a 200 base pair molecule might travel this far and a 500 this far. So I could look at this sample here in sample 2 and say it's one fragment that's probably a, a bit shorter than a thousand, maybe about 900, 800, something like that. Um, whereas I could look over in in sample four here and I go there's two distinct bands one of the bands is about a thousand base pairs long and the other one is somewhere around uh, 650 base pairs long okay um, so there's two bands so I know that there was two two different length strands whereas here there's one band on you there's one length strand So really two factors we can tell how far they travel which tells us the length and how many bands which tells us basically how many fragments a particular person has. Now when we go to look at these, um, these samples and do this analysis there's a, a technique um, called southern blotting and it, 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 um, it, it, this diagram probably makes it look quite, 
quite a complicated process. The level we need to know is that after we've run our gel electrophoresis, um, we use some filter paper to absorb uh, the, the DNA samples. And there's a particular um, part of um, part of the filter paper that we have, which is a, a nitrocellulose uh, filter. And that is what we absorb the uh, DNA sample into. We add lots of little probes and it's those probes that attach to this, this DNA is what we're looking at when we look at our, our diagram later. Um, um, and they might be radioactive probes or something that's gonna show up in an X-ray. So that's southern blotting. So good luck with your studying of gel electrophoresis.